Chapter 8, Introduction to Hypothesis Testing, Part 1. The learning outcomes or objectives for this chapter are as follows. When we're done with this chapter, we'll understand the logic of hypothesis testing. We'll be able to state hypotheses and locate critical region or regions. We'll be able to conduct a z-test and make decisions regarding a hypothesized population. We'll define and differentiate between type 1 and type 2 errors. We'll develop an understanding the, of effect size and be able to compute Cohen's D. And also, we'll develop an understanding be able to make directional hypotheses and conduct a one-tailed test. Tools you will need for this chapter include z-scores. In chapter 5, we learned how to convert an x-value into a z-score. z was equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation. Again, just to review, the z-score indicates the exact location of a score um, in relation to the mean expressed in standard deviation units. A positive z-score is a value above the population mean. A negative z-score is below the population mean. Again, the sign tells us the direction or the side of the mean that the score occurs, and the numeric value indicates how many standard deviation units it is from the center of the distribution. We'll also need to have a, a good understanding of the distribution of sample means, which was discussed in Chapter 7, and the characteristics of the distribution of sample mean, which include the expected value. Um, we learned that if we compute the average of all sample averages, the mean of sample means, it will always equal the population mean. The standard error, we know that we calculate that by taking the standard deviation of the population and dividing by the square root of n. And we learned that by definition, the standard error represents the average difference between a sample mean and the population mean. This is often also referred to as the expected difference between m and mu. And then finally, we'll understand um, that we can use probability um, based on sample means to determine um, the, the likelihood of a certain value occurring in the distribution of sample means. And to do so, we need to understand how to convert a sample mean into a z-score. So z is equal to m minus mu over standard error of the mean. And again, the z-value indicates how far the sample mean is from the population mean and expresses it in standard error units. Hypothesis testing logic. Hypothesis testing is one of the most commonly used inferential procedures. By definition, when we say hypothesis testing, what we mean is that we're engaging in the statistical method that uses sample data to evaluate the validity of a hypothesis about a population parameter. Technically, what we're doing in this chapter is engaging in a z-test. And a z-test refers to um, the process of comparing a sample mean m to a population mean mu. And I should um, did, go back one step and say that it would be a known population. It's important to make that distinction to a known population mean mu. And the reason why that's important is in chapters 9, 10, and 11, those, that's the family of t-test. In that um, process of engaging the hypothesis test, um, requires that we compare a sample um, to an unknown population. We would use um, a sample to um, take the place of that population. So again, a z-test, we have the luxury and we must have population parameters to engage in a z-test. And again, the process is um, com the comparison of a sample mean to population mean. We're trying to determine if the sample mean is very similar to the po known population mean or very different so that we can draw our conclusions. In very simple terms, the logic underlying the hypothesis testing procedure is as follows. First, we state a hypothesis about a population. 
For instance, uh, in the text, uh, we'll be referred to an experiment or an example of a study um, that entails administering electric brain stimulation to individuals to improve math skills. So we may hypothesize that if the entire population were to be given these electric brain stimulations to improve math, let's say on a standardized test, we would expect the pop treated population average score to equal 100. So again, we are hypothesizing about a treated population. And given that if everyone were to receive these electric brain um, stimulations, then they, on average, would score a 100 on a math, a standardized math assessment. Next, um, we predict the expected characteristics of the sample based on the hypothesis. In other words, if we were to um, have the treated population um, or have access to the treated population and selected a sample from that treated population, what would you anticipate the sample mean to equal? Again, the sample's coming from the treated population that we're hypothesi hypothesizing about. So we would anticipate that the sample mean would be equal to 100 or something close to it. And I say close to it because we learned about sampling error, that whenever we take a sample from a population, we don't expect it to be identical to the population parameter. Um, and if it is somewhat different, we would anticipate that um, it's simply due to sampling error, that um, the sample mean doesn't include all the x values that are um, part of the population. But nonetheless, again, we would expect the sample mean to equal the population mean. Again, this sample is coming from the treated population. So next, if we were to obtain a random sample from the population that we're hypothesizing about, we would expect that sample mean to be very similar to the population mean. And then it, our job is to compare the obtained sample with the predict, um, prediction made from the hypothesis. If consistent, meaning that if our sample mean is indeed close to the untreated population mean that we hypothesize, then the hypothesis is reasonable. If discrepant, then the hypothesis is rejected, meaning that, um, let's say, for instance, our sample mean were equal to 80. And just as an aside, and this information will, will come in a subsequent slide, but I'll introduce it now. If we were to say the untreated population average is equal to 80. So um, the population takes the standardized test um, and their average score is 80. And we are hypothesizing that if the population were to receive these electric brain um, stimulation, this, that type of treatment, that their average would actually be higher and equal 100. And if we were to take a sample from that population and was equal to 100, then we would have support for this idea that the treated population mean would equal 100. If, however, the sample taken is equal to 80, then it's equivalent to what the untreated population average was equal to, and therefore we don't have support for this hypothesis that we had set um, forth in the beginning. Now it's important to note at this point that we are hypothesizing about a treated population, but the hypothesis test is all grounded in testing the null hypothesis. The null is always saying that nothing is happening, that the treatment is ineffective, or if we're testing a, um, the difference between a quasi-independent variable, for example, gender, the null is going to say there, there is no difference in um, the standardized test scores between males and females. In this case, um, the standardized math test score average will not differ um, if they receive treatment or if they don't receive treatment. So again, this is the logic behind it, but when it comes to engaging in the test itself, we're going to be testing the null hypothesis. So I just want to point that out so you don't get confused when we get to that point in this chapter. Figure 8.1 illustrates the basic design of um, an experiment. And here we see that uh, we begin with the untreated population um, parameters. 
For example, we have um, a population average of 80 with a standard deviation of 20. We notice that the original untreated population has a normal shape, it's symmetrical. And the parameters identified here pertain to the example that I presented a minute ago, um, looking at the effects of receiving electric brain stimulation to improve math skills. So the untreated population average math um, score is equal to 80. So individuals in the population have taken a standardized math assessment. Their average score is equal to 80 with a standard deviation of 20. Again, the standard deviation represents on average how much each person's standardized test score deviates from this average, which is equal to 80. So again, on the left, we have the known population before treatment. And we recognize the purpose of the research is to determine um, the effect of the treatment on the individuals in the population. So in this case, the treatment is exposing individuals to this electric brain stimulation to see if it has an effect on their um, average score on this standardized math assessment. So let's discuss um, what the untreated, excuse me, the treated, the unknown treated population would look like. So we have down here that the mean is unknown um, because we anticipate there to be a difference, right? That's what we're hypothesizing, that the treated population mean will be different. If it's not different, if we don't hypothesize it to be different, then there's no point in doing research. So we hypothesize that it will be something different than 80. And the distribution um, is normal. And notice that the standard deviation is equal for the treated population, the treated population in comparison to the untreated population. And this is a, just a basic assumption that is made about the effect of the treatment um, to simplify the hypothesis testing um, situation or scenario. If the treatment has an effect, what we understand is that each x value is um, being increased or decreased by a constant. For this case, we would anticipate that the um, brain stimulation is going to increase the math scores, but we may just hypothesize that it has an effect, that it will either decrease or increase it, depending on what the original hypothesis, um, how it's worded. But again, what we understand that if the treatment is effective, essentially each x value is going to increase or decrease by a particular constant. And we should remember that in chapter 3 and 4, this, this information was presented. We talked about the rules of adding or subtracting a constant. So just as a refresher, a reminder, we indicated that the new mean would equal the original plus or minus the constant. And then the standard deviation, the new standard deviation would always equal the original when we add or subtract um, a constant. So that's why we see that these to be equivalent to one another. But the means are different, right? Because we're not sure what that constant is yet, but we anticipate it to be different from the original untreated population. So based on this rule, we assume that the population after treatment has the same shape. Again, the shape is a reflection of the variability. And if the standard deviation is equal, the shape would also be the same. Um, so we understand the shape to be equal and the standard deviation to be equal. And they go hand in hand. If the standard deviation changes, the shape changes. Um, and if the standard deviation doesn't change, then the shape remains the same. So note that the unknown population after treatment is the focus of the research question. Again, the mu of the, un, the treated population is our point of interest. Specifically, the purpose of the research is to determine what would happen if the treatment were administ administered to every individual in the population. Um, again, we would, in the real world, not be able to do this, which is why we use a sample. Um, as a way of drawing these conclusions. We wouldn't be able to administer the treatment to the entire population, but we can take a sample from the untreated population, administer treatment, and then draw conclusions about the effects of the treatment on that sample and apply it to the, the treated population, which is the basis of our um, interest, the basis of the initial hypothesis. 
Figure 8.2 shows the structure of the research study from the point of view of the hypothesis test. The original population before treatment is shown on the left-hand side. So over here, and those uh, we, we have the known original population mu to equal 80. So again, this is pertaining to the example of a standardized math assessment administered to the population. Their average score is equal to 80. The unknown population after treatment is shown on the right-hand side over here. Again, we're not sure what that mean would equal. Note that the unknown population is actually a hypothetical. The treatment is never administered to the entire population. It would be unlikely, you know, unrealistic to think that we would have access to the entire population that we could administer treatment to. Instead, we are asking what would happen if the treatment were administered to the entire population. What would we expect that treated population mu to equal? So the research study involves selecting a sample from the original population. So again, we take a sample, that's this group here, let's just say of, of, of a particular size. Um, let's say our sample size is equal to 20. We have 20 individuals, and then we administer treatment to those 20 individuals. So those 20 receive treatment, and then we record the scores for the individuals in the treated sample, and we, we calculate what the mean is equal to. So we take all of those 20 individual scores. They receive the electric brain stimulation. They, they take the um, standardized math assessment, and then we calculate the average um, for that treated sample. So notice that the research study produces a treated sample. Although the sample was obtained indirectly, in other words, this blue um, group here, this treated sample, didn't come directly from here, right? But is a, it is a representation of, hypothetically, if we were to have administered treatment to the whole population, we would expect this sample to be represented of that. But it came indirectly from here, right? We took it from here. Um, the unknown, excuse me, the known untreated population. But again, notice that it was taken directly from there, but indirectly it is a representation of the unknown treated population. So again, the hypothesis test uses the treated sample on the right-hand side to evaluate a hypothesis about the unknown treated population on the right-hand side of this particular figure. So again, I had said in a previous slide that let's say we anticipate the treated um, population to equal 100, right? That's what we're hypothesizing. And um, depending on what the sample mean is equal to, will either lend itself to supporting this idea that the electric um, brain stimulation is effective or it lends itself to rejecting that idea and saying that the electric brain stimulation is ineffective, that the treatment didn't have an effect on the standardized test scores. So again, we're hoping that our sample mean here is, is equal to 100 or something close to it, opposed to it equaling 80, which was the original, right? We're hoping that this is not the case. Um, because if it is the case, if after treatment their sample mean is equivalent to the original untreated population mean, then the treatment wasn't effective. And as a researcher, obviously you are hypothesizing about this treatment because you're vested in it. You, you hope that it is effective and that it does show some kind of effect or change or difference in comparison to the untreated population parameters. In short, a hypothesis test is a formalized procedure that fo follows a standard series of operations. Consequently, researchers understand this standardized method and are, are able to evaluate the results not only of their study, but of other researchers' studies as well. To emphasize the formal structure of a hypothesis test, we present the hypothesis testing as a four-step process that is used throughout the rest of this textbook. And in the following example, we'll go through that four-step process to give you a, a concrete foundation of how to engage in um, conducting a hypothesis test. The four steps of a hypothesis test are as follows. Step one, we're going to state the hypotheses, and this includes the research 
in the null. And the research is denoted by H sub 1 in the null, H sub 0. And we'll talk more about those in, um, in a coming up slide. Step 2, set the criteria for a decision. Again, the decision is going to be based on the likelihood of um, the sample mean. So is that sample mean a common value or is it a very uncommon value? Is it centered around the mu, the population mu, or is it out in the, in the tails? denoting that there is some difference and some change or um, as a result of the treatment that was administered. Step three, and so first, let me just back up a second. So to set the criteria, we're going to determine the um, probability of um, the sample mean that deems it to be rare or common. And then we're going to collect the data from the sample Compute the sample statistics, which include uh, would include the sample mean, which would be the most important statistic that we need to calculate. And then we're going to make a decision. We're going to draw our conclusions based on where that sample mean resides in relation to the mu. So essentially, we'll be discussing um, the location of the mean. So anything you know in this common region would lend itself to a conclusion that the treatment was ineffective. But if our sample mean is out in the tail, right, based on, again, this criteria that we're going to set, if it's out in the tail, then we have reason to believe that the treatment was effective, that the, the mu of the treated, po treated population, again, is representative of that sample mean, and that we would see difference. So let me just draw this again um, in the example of the um, electric stimulation um, that will supposedly have an effect on standardized math test scores. So if we were to have the untreated mu represented here, and that was equal to 80. And let's say the sample mean, those who received treatment, their average was equal to 100. Again, we understand the sample to be representative of what would happen if we administered treatment to everyone in the population. And so let's just say it's equal to 100. We assume that that is representative of the treated population. And we would say mu of 100 is representative of the treated population. And again, we see this movement, right, in the mu. And it's our job to determine if that movement is large enough for us to conclude that this is uh, statistically significant, that it is unlikely that we would obtain a sample mean of 100 um, from the untreated population. Let me state that again, that it is our job to determine um, you know, the likelihood of obtaining a sample mean equal to 100 from the untreated population. If the probability is very low that it, um, of obtaining a sample mean equal to 100 from the untreated population, then we have support for the idea that the treatment was effective. If the probability is high, then we would say that there's really no difference between an average of 80 and 100, and the difference between 80 and 100 is simply due to um, sampling error or chance. So, um, this is just a basic introduction of the process that we're engaging in and using this four-step process to better understand it. And now we're going to learn about the um, specifics of each of each of these four steps in, in the slides to, um, to come. So step one, state the hypotheses. So we have to state the null hypothesis. And the null states that in general, um, in the general population, there is no change, no difference or is um, no relationship. Now, this the concept of no relationship is um, in relation to chapter 14, which is about correlation. So we'll talk about correlation, which um, means the relationship between variables. So the null hypothesis when we're engaging in an experiment essentially means that there's no change or no difference in the mean. Um, and for the example of the electric brain stimulation, we would state that the null says the electric stimulation has no effect on 
on math skills. So again, the math skills are going to be measured using the standardized math test. But again, here we're saying whether you get the electric brain stimulation treatment or not, you'll see no movement in the mean of the standardized math assessment. The alternative or research hypothesis states that there is a change, a difference, or there is a relationship in the general population. So again, the relationship pertains to correlational studies. We'll still use the research and null hypothesis when we talk about correlational studies. But for experiments um, or quasi-experiments using a quasi-independent variable, we'll focus on this concept of change or difference. And so in this case, the research hypothesis would state that um, the electric stimulation, brain stimulation, excuse me, does have an effect on math skills. Again, the math skills will be measured using the standardized math assessment. And um, another thing to point out is that we have mathematical notation to go along with the research and null hypothesis. So in a um, previous slide, it indicated that the untreated population mean is equal to 80, that if they don't receive this treatment, the average standardized math test score is equal to 80. And therefore, the null is going to state that the treated population, mu treated, is equal to 80, that there's no difference, right? Uh, that they're saying no change, no difference. Therefore, the treated mu would equal the untreated mu. Again, this is untreated. And the research hypothesis is going to state that the mu treated is, I'll give you a second to think about it, if the null is saying it's equal to 80, the untreated um, mu, according to the research, would be that it's not equal to 80, that we expect something different, right? We're, we're emphasizing change or difference. Um, so we do need to include this mathematical notation, and you are responsible for knowing how to do this. Um, we could also uh, um, see this stated as a directional hypothesis. I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I will discuss that more in detail later, but this is a good example to focus on just to introduce the difference between what we mean by directional versus non-directional. So this hypothesis is considered non-directional. Notice that I stated the electric brain stimulation does not have an effect on math skills. Oh, excuse me. Um, I meant to say does have. So let me restate that. The research hypothesis, um, the second one here says the electric brain stimulation does, excuse me, does have an effect on math skills. Now notice that I didn't say it's going to increase or decrease. So the fact that it's absent of direction um, then means that it's considered a non-directional hypothesis. Another way of expressing non-directional is saying that it's a two-tailed test. So um, if the average untreated mu is equal to 80, if I have a sample mean out in this tail, meaning that it increased the math scores, or if it significantly decreased it, I get to reject the null hypothesis. So again, it may be that we expect that brain stimulation to increase math skills, but normally most hypotheses start at the non-direction level and then we revise it and then engage in um, supplemental research and revise our hypothesis so that it's one-tailed. And I'll explain more about that in, in a later slide. Um, but had I said that I expect the um, electric brain stimulation to increase math skills, then that has um, some implications for the notation. So again, if I were to have said that it does have an effect, instead of just saying it does have an effect, let's say um, I revise that. So I paused it to make some edits. So if I were to say the electric brain stimulation increases math skills, then that's considered directional. 
and as a result when we're looking at the distribution of sample means then we're going to focus on just one tail so again here's the untreated mu we're hoping that our sample mean is over here indicating that there was an increase and if it falls in this lower tail on the left then then that doesn't support our hypothesis in in terms of the notation then you would see something written like this so the untreated would be greater than 80 right because we said it increases and the null hypothesis would be edited to then say the opposite the opposite so it would say that the untreated is less than and or equal to 80 so it always includes the equal but then if it's directional it has to have the opposite direction of the hypothesis so here I'm expecting it to increase therefore here I would say it would be less than and then also including the equal sign. So that's just a little preview of what's to come when we talk more in detail about directional and non-directional hypotheses. But here again, step one is to state the hypotheses, both the null and the research, and also include the proper mathematical notation. Step two, set the decision criterion. So the distribution of sample outcomes is divided into two things, those that are likely if the null is true and those that are very unlikely if the null is true. Again, it's always a, get a test of the null. The null says nothing is happening. So if we look at our distribution, right, essentially what we're saying is anything in the center is very likely. because those are commonly occurring values. And in the tails, right, we're indicating that those are un very unlikely. And we're gonna use the alpha level to be very specific about that cutoff, and I'll talk about it in just a second. But um, if it, we need to recognize, again, it's all about the null. The null says nothing is happening. So if we have a distribution, um, the null says that nothing is happening and, and the majority of sample means will reside around this center. But we will, we recognize that in a normal distribution we do have these extremes in the tails. They are commonly, they are occurring, not commonly, but they do occur in the normal distribution. But again, they are few occurrences of those extremes, especially if we're talking about a sample a collection of X values that produce a rare or unlikely sample um, statistic or sample mean. The alpha level or significance level um, is a probability um, value used to define very unlikely. Um, and the common, the common um, values for alpha um, commonly accepted include alpha equal to 0 0.05, which is the same as saying 5%, alpha equal to 0 0.01, which is 1%, and alpha equal to 0 0.001, which is equal to 0.1%. So these alphas are identifying the percentage of values in the tails. And we can think about it as we are looking for sample means that have a 5% or less chance of occurring, a 1% or less chance of occurring, or a 0.1% or less chance of occurring. So again, it's, it's about finding those rare occurrences. Well, I think we would agree that something that has a 5% chance isn't very likely, as is 1% or 0.1%. Those are all illustrations of things that are rare. Um, unlikely to occur and so if we do get a value that has a 5% or less a chance of occurring then we have support for the idea that that value was produced due to treatment um, but we also recognize it could just occur because of chance but more likely it's as a result of the treatment so again these are the common values of alpha for our purposes we'll, we'll mostly see the use of 5% and 1% for the examples um, in our homework and our exam. Now, if I were to ask you which, which alpha appears to be most stringent, uh, meaning the 
more difficult um, of a test is illustrated in one of these alphas. Well, if you were to say in the comparison between 1% and 5%, 1% is more stringent research because, again, something that only has a 1% or less chance of occurring is very rare, um, or more so in comparison to something that has a 5% chance. So we'll talk about that um, and the ease of the test or the likelihood of rejecting the null based on the alpha. But again, these are the common alphas that we'll be applying. Um, in our hypothesis test in this chapter and in subsequent chapters. So the critical region consists of the extreme sample outcomes, as I just discussed, and again, we refer to those as be being very unlikely because their frequency of occurring um, is low. The boundaries of the critical region or regions, and it's plural because if we have a non-directional test, we're looking at both tails. If it's a um, one-directional test, then we would just have one critical region. So the boundaries of the critical region or regions are determined by the probability set by the alpha. So again, the critical region is set by our alpha level and defines the values that are considered to be very unlikely. So here is a wonderful diagram of, of what we mean by unlikely. So this is distribution of sample means that the null hypothesis is true, all the possible outcomes. So um, again, here the null, the mu from the null, the null is going to state, as in the, the previous example, we said that um, the mu untreated was equal to 80. So the mu from the null would be 80 because we're saying that even if they receive treatment, um, their hypothesis of the null states that the treated population mean is also equal to 80, that there's no difference, no change. And once we set that, then using our alpha level, we're going to create these boundaries that um, define the critical region. And in the center, we recognize that these values have a high probability, right, because again, based on frequency, these are high, um, highly occurring, very probable values if the null is true. And in the tails, we have what we define as extreme low probability values if the null were true. Again, the null says nothing is happening. The null is stating that the treated population is equal to the untreated population. And given this normal distribution, if we took a sample from the distribution of sample means, we could possibly get a sample over here in the extreme, and it may not be as a result of treatment. The likelihood that it's due to treatment is high, but we recognize that that sample does make up part of that distribution of untreated samples. So we'll talk more about that when we discuss the difference between a type 1 and type 2 error. But nonetheless, the shaded area is the ideal area in which you hope your sample mean resides. So after treatment, we hope our sample means are out in the tail as opposed to the white area in the center, which are common values. So figure 8.4 demonstrates setting the critical region at an alpha equal to 0.05 or 5%. Um, so this is more concrete. And it's all grounded in what we, the baby steps that we learned in the two previous chapters of um, partitioning off the center of the distribution where it represents 95% of the distribution. So here we see that where they um, have this area in the center in white that represents 90%, 95% of the occurrences or the sample means of this distribution of sample means. Here in the center, we have the mu that's, that's derived from the null. The null says that the treated population will equal the untreated population. And in terms of a z-score, the mean of the distribution is always equal to zero. And um, if we have 95% in the center, we have 5% left over. And that 5%, when it's a non-directional test, is split amongst the two tails. So technically, we're looking for a value above the mean that has a 2.5% chance or below the mean that has a 2.5% chance. But collectively, we're hoping for a sample mean that has a 5% or less chance of occurring spread across two tails. 
Now these z-scores, we learned how to find these given that middle 95%. And really quickly, I'm not going to go through this and show you the unit normal table because we've done that in the past, but just as a refresher, we took that 95% and split in half. And what's left in terms of a proportion is 0 0.4750 here, 0 0.4750 here. This is representative of the area between the mean and the z. And if we were to use that column, that's how we find the z-score of 1.96, positive and negative 1.96. We could also use the tail, the proportion of the tail, which is 0 0.0250. And over here, 0 0.0250, we can use that and enter the tail in the unit normal table to find these z-scores as well. But now we understand that if we calculate the z-score for a sample mean, again, z is equal to m minus mu over standard error of the mean, what we've now established is that if the sample mean is equivalent to a z-score greater than 1.96 on the positive or um, less than given a negative value of negative 1.96, then we get to reject the norm. We get to reject the idea that nothing happened, that the treatment was ineffective. And if it falls in the center, we fail to reject the norm. Um, so again, saying that we have support for the idea that nothing happened. We're hoping to reject the null. That's the ideal. Um, and we can only do so if our sample means fall in the tail of the distribution and have um, a, a probability less than what we've set for alpha. So I know this is a lot of information, but as we go through examples in the demonstration videos, and also if you take the time to do the learning checks in your text, you'll start to see how this all works. But again, these, this is the basic structure for um, hypothesis test where alpha is set at 5% and it gives you a sense of what you do with the null if your value falls in the critical region, in this case those blue shaded areas, or if it falls in the common region, the white area in the center. We're hoping to reject the null um, given our sample means would reside in the critical region and we would fail to reject the null if it falls in the center. Um, area denoted by again by this white area in this in the graph uh, or figure 8.4 and that concludes part one of chapter eight in part two I'm going to begin with the learning check which is not my normal um, procedure but since this this video is run a little bit long I'm going to start the next video with a learning check and then move into part two of chapter eight